have it here. Another hot day here locally, so we consider hot. Um, I would say everything that goes over 25 Celsius, so now it's very uh, close to 30s. <laughs> but anyway, what are we going to look at now? Um, we're actually going to deep dive into the source code for a basic language programming environment. Um, and it also has a related compiler implementations that can compile the um, basic code into standalone ex uh, executable. Now the source code it um, targets the Motorola 68000 based Amiga computers uh, running the Amiga OS uh, 2.0. And um, this code base is very large, and it um, actually only contains um, Motorola 68000 assembler. <laughs> so no C, nothing else. Just 68000 assembler. Um, the code base is. Um, as f I've done some kind of archaeological analysis of. So I, I think that it's from around 1988 to 1992, so that's like the time period. Um, the original uh, source is compiled on, on the Amiga platform itself, and um, uses two different um, high soft dev pack compilers, so they have two versions in parallel, so depending on what module it's compiling, then it uses one compiler or the other. So the, uh, it uses um, Genam uh, version 2 or Genam version 3, um, yeah, depending on what mod. Uh, also this is an interesting implementation in which the source code is directly compiled into executable hunk code. So e even if it's dot named like a library, a dot library, then it's still, um, it's still a, defined as a, a hunk executable. Um, I got a little bit of um, reference material, so it's useful if you're going to follow this video to its full extent that um, you uh, watch some of the previous videos I've made. Uh, I'm going to put the uh, li description and links in the comments, but I just want to mention them here. So one of the videos is about um, how to get started with assembly programming on, on the Amiga, so I have a video about that. Um, and then how to actually set up the uh, almost professional and compiler 2.0 on a virtual machine Amiga emulator and um, then I also have um, one video that describes how to um, uh, build the this uh, source code on Amiga using the um, dip pack tools um, and um, since this requires a bit of uh, the Windows implementation requires retooling, so then I've actually um, built packages and um, I've um, put them on GitHub and I'll, and I'll post the address. So, yeah, in the comments also. Uh, and there was some, um, yeah sometimes useful to have access to the 68000 um, programmers reference so I've actually added a link to the, I have a link to those and to the actual source code that I've used to compile oh, source code so <coughs> I took the original um, source code and just put it into a temporary directory so a clean call. Um, so we want this has successfully been shown to compile on, on the Amiga platform, so no issues with that. So, so then the, the issue is, okay, well, how do you get this to run, can be compiled on Windows then? And um, the first thing one needs to do, or I needed to do, was to come into the um, C folder. And here we notice that it has some custom build tools, which are actually... Um, compiled Amos code. So they, they've written an Amos program in Amos Basic and then they run the compiler and then they've created a uh, Amiga executable and of course that's not going to work on Windows. So you can't run that on Windows. So my uh, first task was to um, convert all these tools to um, uh, 
Python. Um, and um, arguably most of these tools are verification, so the only one that actually does anything from a development, uh, producing binary perspective is this one, get chunk. And um, we'll just spend a little bit of time on this. This is actually interesting. Uh, so when it compiles a file, then this utility will go and ta go and um, access the created chunk and move it into another file. So, uh, so um, I'll show you that in combination with with looking at the um, the um, compile structure. So if we go one folder structure up, then uh, and this is actually described in my uh, I've described all of this already in the Amiga compiled video. Um, just to take the basics here, so it's uh, the building of the system is based on Amiga scripts, and in the root of the folder you have all, all these scripts are the ones that you you run. I mean the Amiga scripts. So of course, if you, this won't run on Windows, so so one of the other task that you have is that um, you need to convert these scripts. So. Um, and then also the issue is that um, it, Will not be able. You won't be able to use the same compilers because they're Amiga executables. So then I uh, have to migrate to a new um, to the um, Wasm um, assembler instead. So here we have the start root start of all the um, compiling, and um, it basically it executes the uh, subscripts one at a time, and then. After it's done that, then it um, runs a, 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 a script that basically <laughs> runs some tests, which means that it <coughs> uses its, uh, the Amos compiler to compile Amos code. So um, that's that's the <laughs> the sanity check for the compiler. So um, let's have a look at um, uh, see lib. We can have a look at that. So here you see. Um, what the original um, Amiga script looks like. So uh, here it's running these uh, tools like make talk table and uh, make labels. And then here you have uh, uh, the, uh, the line where it does the actual assembling of the code. And then if we take a look at where the hunk is used, that was, um, So basically, I, it compiles um, a, a config data implementation, and the I explained in a previous video. But the config data is binary data in uh, Amos. So basically, it, it, it builds a config file from a source file, and then <coughs> it uses get chunk to actually go and get the executable chunk, which is the actual configuration part, data part, and then it moves it into um, into a storage location. So anyway, what, as I said, that it um, uh, produces everything as hunk X, and that um, uh, then we need to look at the actual. Um, this is the way I found out what, what, what was it looking for when, it, when it's compiling. So I had to actually open the binary um, file and, um, and check the code for the um, honk header. And um, that's there. So it's 03F3. So that's the... I, I, I tried the 
you know, different trunk uh, or exit uh, options on the compiler to figure out <laughs> when it will start making the correct format. And as soon as this code appeared, then I said, okay, now, now I got the correct option. It wasn't really clear to me what what, what the um, original compiler was um, spitting out. But, um, uh, yeah, after this analysis, I knew. Ah, uh, the other little uh, trickiness is, of course, that um, if you're with this get hunk, um, that um, the, the binary data is, of course, written uh, following the um, Motorola standard for number encoding in bytes. So if you have a, a long data type, then it's going to store it according to the to the logic on the um, Motorola platform. And um, it's different on Intel, so then you need to make, make sure that when you're writing code on Intel and you're reading data that's come, that's targeting or comes from Motorola that you actually do the little Indian, big Indian um, and, and decoding and encoding in the correct way, otherwise it's going to get messed up. So I had to spend a little bit of time on, on that. So I'll move over to the Windows side of things and um, here's the equivalent C folder. So I've cleaned it out. Um, so in this parallel copy of the source then has the Python um, implementations and then um, it also has the um, Basam uh, compiler also here uh, ah, V-Link is actually not needed we can take that away um, yeah and then if we go um, uh, if we go one folder up and then we um, scroll down and we see that here I've made a CMD implementation of the um, equivalent Amiga scripts. So if we just take a look at these. So here we see the main script. So it looks a little bit more familiar for those that worked on Windows. So CMD scripts, and then you call each individual, and then um, the actual um, verification part, uh, script has been um, moved, so um, a bit about that later. And then we should have a look at um, another script file, which it calls... This one. So this one I've included a little bit more, um, yeah, as you see, random documentation about the um, actual assembler use. So let's see what comments I had here. Um, so the first option is slash dev pack. So that basically what happens is that the assembler will switch to a mode where it's a dev pack compiler or syntax compatible. Yeah. And that's an important, important statement to make. It's syntax compatible. It doesn't say that it's going to produce the exact same binary output. It's, it just says that, okay, if, if, if you write thing definitions in the style of DevPack, uh, according to DevPack manuals, uh, then, then uh, we will compile it. Uh, then... Uh, Hunk exe generate executable file, so that's basically a general rule. So it doesn't matter if it's con so called config data or a library or an, an actual Amiga executable, everything is produced with the same option. And that you can see if you do this, what I showed prior to look at the actual binary output from the Amiga compiler, compiler then you will see that it um, actually is the case. Um, Yeah, this was like you saw. I took the V link away because when you you use Vasam and you say that it's an executable hunt that it's producing, then there's no linking. There's no linking phase. And so, and that's the way they used the old um, compiler also. That they or the, or it looks like the um, the older two compilers they produce directly hunk format also. So there's no 
yeah, you, you don't you don't need to link anything. And, and that was a little bit of a disturbance in the beginning. Though, well, what is this? It's just running a compiler, and then you know, where's the linking and stuff, all the object file handling? And then I just suddenly, when I started looking into it, then it was like, aha, okay, so it's just it's kicking out um, hunks of X, so you know, there's no there's no linking. Um, And uh, no case means that for uh, symbols and names used that, um, that it will ignore the case. And this is very interesting because in some source files you have to use it and in some other source files you can't use it. And I haven't investigated exactly but the thing is that they did have two different versions of the assembler being used. So I think that one assembler uh, they handle the case sensitivity differently. Uh, I, I haven't dug into the documentation or anything, but I, I think that the, because in, in as I said that in in different script files I've enabled or disabled the no case, but depending on what I've tested, that actually seems to work. Okay. You get a lot of warnings, um, heaps of them. I'll have a little bit of a deeper discussion about that later, but basically we're, we are now ignoring all warnings. Um, now if you want to optionally create a cross-reference listing, that means a, a detailed report about the assembly uh, process. Um, uh, and to be able to match the assembly code with the actual object uh, binary that you're producing, then you can um, use slash L to create a listing file. Uh, it takes much longer to compile, so I have not enabled it by default. But if you if you want like heap loads of information in detail about the uh, how it converted the <coughs> the assembler text into the actual object code, then you you, need, you can um, uh, make it produce a listing file. So yeah, then it, it basically is deleting some files that it considers working files, and that's the same logic in the Omega scripts. And um, uh, oh, that actually looks a bit wrong because it's an it should be on the same line. So basically, the, the output I uh, on the Windows implementation, what I do is I I um, make it um, uh, write the output file. Wait, I'll do the last one. Uh, so we have it actually. There. Uh, still. There. Sorry, a smaller text, but now you can at least see the whole line. So the idea on the Windows implement, uh, when we uh, compile it on Windows, is that um, I um, force all the compiler uh, compiles the results to go to a temporary directory which I call copy to Amiga and in a, in a structure there and, and a little bit more about that also later since um, you know on Windows you don't have an Amiga so the idea is that you could actually run this compile on any just standalone on any Windows machine uh, and you don't have to have the Amiga set up or anything so and then yeah you know, you'll see later how the process works related to that I think now we've covered that, um, yeah, and then we're using the VASM, and, and that's described in one of my videos, how to set up, uh, how to get that on uh, set up or installed. So we've covered dev pack, no case, no warnings, hunk X, uh, and the storage of the output files. And, and uh, you know, I'm not going to go through every single script uh, file because it's, it basically follows the same form. And calls the utility programs as they um, as they did in the in the, in the old um, on the, or when you do the Amiga. I actually converted all the Python implementations independent if it was uh, like the uh, get hunk, which is actually needed for the binary production. But uh, all these other ones, they just produce information. Uh, so what I've done is I make them um, create log files of uh, of the output of each of these. Plus that they create their own files also. Um, probably it was more useful when they were actually doing active development and they needed to keep track of size. 
and and then which functions are in which libraries and uh, so I, I think that if you're just ma making hobbyist changes or uh, editing, fixing small bugs and stuff, or, or just code research, then those aren't really, I don't think they're that important. So, a little bit about um, this copy to Amiga folder. So basically uh, here it caches all the files that the compilers create, all the data files that are created. Uh, and they're put in a structure that is equivalent to what you have the assigned structure in on the Amigo. Um, so the idea is you, you compile this, you, st you, you um, start up the Amiga, you have Amos installed there, you map this uh, uh, or you map the source code as a drive like I've described in the in the previous videos and then um, you, you have um, uh, an Amiga script here and I can actually show that So I'm not going into details, but it, it basically, it, uh, since, since you run the compilers and then all of the compiler scripts put the files in this structure, and then this script here, you run it on the Amiga, and then it copies the, uh, it, re it replaces all the already installed files with the compiled files. And then at the end, it runs the actual um, compile tests script which I can also show here just very quickly so here it actually <laughs> the the sanity test for this <coughs> the, the building process is that it runs the Amos compiler and then it compiles the uh, the actual tools uh, that are used in the uh, build process to, and, that, and that's the sanity check for, uh, for the um, system so you know, I thought what might be more interesting is to dig, dig, dig into some other aspects of the code that I've um, found issue. And this is this no case or or um, uh, or not. <laughs> um, I mean, Vasam is basically it's strictly case sensitive by default, and uh, and um, here you see some examples. So I just uh, you know the. In varying degree, you have different cases used in the name, and, and then that causes them to be um, unique when it comes to Vasa. And then you usually get these kind of, uh, yeah, reference to undefined symbol style. Or, but you can also get very cryptic error messages like this one. Uh, it can be more, uh, you know, like by long is actually defined as by long equals RS, where RS has to be. So you have like a cascading definition that then fails, and that that could really uh, cause very mysterious errors that, that, that don't make on the top of the thing. They don't really make any sense. Um, but there are some permanent label issues that um, uh, that can't be fixed, uh, that need to be fixed in the code, and, and 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 I have fixed them in, and I've made a diff, a patch that I put on GitHub. And, and that's really, for example, here we have this one where there's some, um, this is basically defined as a local label. And, and basically they're, they're in two sections of the code and, and um, they, it, it, the compiler doesn't accept that they're far enough to be unique. Now th this is an interesting debate that in, in assembler compilers, like when they say uh, locally unique. Uh, what does that mean in exact byte? Like exact, exactly what does that mean? You know, so is it like uh, this close or that close or, or what? <laughs> so in this case, there seems, there seems to be a disagreement between Basam and, uh, and the original Highsoft compiler as to what's um, so-called locally locally unique. Because uh, the dot usually is the definition that it's a local uh, label. So, but then locality is the definition in itself. So. Not a, uh, yeah, whatever that means. But anyway, the, the, this needs to be fixed because it is a uh, a permanent error. So you can't you can't compile it or something if you don't fix it. And, and no case or case to the, 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 that has to, it, it doesn't help. And the, but there were only two of these cases, uh, as I said, that there there you get this issue of what is local and what is not. 
And then we have another case here, which is called Cases of Incomplete Opcode Definitions. And here it's missing the type. So you have BNE dot what, 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 um, what number type? Like, is it long? Is it byte? Is it word? What is it? And um, basically, you know, it needs to be dot s. And um, you know, the, then of course, the what becomes interesting is what is the dev pack compiler doing? Um, I mean, you can track it down. You can actually disassemble the, co op the code generated by the pack and then go through that route. Or you can look at the local examples of what is predominantly being used. And then, then you can also work on the logic of the command itself, that what is it doing. So, so basically, I did a combination of those and then um, I just fixed it. Um, and there's only one instance of it. So how did, how did that get through? So <laughs> Uh, and then there are cases of opcode differences in produced binary output, and um, here here you actually have to run the analysis using the Motorola um, developer guide, uh, where you actually look into the encoding of the um, opcode. Op and then you basically, I took one example here, and I won't go too much into detail, but it's basically it's the. Uh, I made a very long description here, but I'll try and keep it. I mean, it was basically, this is going to use, on a higher level, is it going to use AND, or is it going to use immediate AND? And even if you read the um, Motorola developer instruction, and you, you, you read the sections for both instructions five times over, you, it's still vaguely difficult to realize what the, is there any difference at all in the functionality? Um, yeah, so basically, they the, the, the functional difference is, in my opinion, non-existent. So it it doesn't matter. And then there's a <laughs> on Reddit there's a raving debate about this: uh, that should you use uh, Motorola and or and immediate in in certain circumstances? So it doesn't seem to be a very <laughs> uh, turf wars on, on on what that should be. But anyway, from the perspective of, of our compiling. Uh, it c it can be, uh, but I, I, I there wasn't that many of these um, opcode differences, and, and I basically I did a more detailed analysis on this one, and a brief overview of some of the others. And I, it wasn't like the whole file was full of differences. It's it's like very specific instances of code where it's not one could arguably say it's not producing exactly the same output. As what the as you have typed in as the opcode definition in um, in the assembler, and all all optimizations are disabled, so that it isn't a question of optimization; it's a purely a question of interpretation. Uh, and then here we have um, of incorrect opcode extensions being used, so. And the S should be actually it should be a byte definition because it's a byte data. Uh, and then there was only two instances of that. Uh, now there are special registers in the processor uh, uh, that need addressing from time to time, and that's the. Uh, CCR and SR registries, and I took this directly from the programmer's manual. And and, and the thing is that these are uh, these registry registers for future compatibility reasons, mostly because lots of the lot, I mean, a lot of the register on the six eight thousand it's, it's a lot of the register is not used. It's like it's a it's some eight bytes or eight bits that are being used and then the rest is just zeros but the idea with why they're forcing everybody to use word sized in my opinion is that they want to have future compatibility so they they force everybody to write code that's always writing to the full theoretical register that may or may not be implemented in the future 
So then um, you can't use um, the byte definition to write to those registers. You need to use the word. And this, of course, is a difference in the compiler also. That the Y1 compiler accepts this and the other one doesn't. But um, basically you need, to, you need to convert to word writing otherwise. And it's even in the Motorola. So it, it cannot even be a misunderstanding of the Motorola programming manual because that manual is from the same age as the, even the original compilers. I didn't even actually time what the... Uh, uh, I tried to estimate how long it take to build, but it was too, too short time to even bother about it. And then the thing is that if one disabled the um, verification tools, it would be even shorter. So it's, it's basically it's under a minute. <laughs> so compiling it on Windows is like... Uh, uh, you, you don't have enough time to really react and then it's already compiled absolutely everything and so that means if you do development on it where you're only changing one specific library or something then that, the, the, the time is, is too short to even notice uh, okay a little bit about testing so what I did is I backed up all the files uh, on the, from the emulator and that's actually here this whole directory where it um, puts the save data for the disks and stuff, so I took the, the copy of the whole thing. So shut down the emulator, back up that folder, and then um, start the emulator again. And then run the full build on Windows, I'll show that um, soon. Uh, and then run the... Uh, the uh, test, run the script on Amiga. And then we'll start the editor and then the uh, compiler just to see that it actually works. Oh, and I had a. <coughs> I was going to go through every every file here, but I don't think that that's. I, I have that information in the other videos that I'm be making. So what files are? Or <coughs> what files are related to the Amos and stuff? But anyway, um. So that was that. Um, so what I think we should do now is to actually watch it compile on Windows. So I'll just use the copy I made to the temp directories. And then I just listed all the um, command files. And then we run it from here. So, that's it. Done. Finished. You can go home now. <laughs> so anyway, what this does is, as I said previously, it, it compiles everything according to the same logic that it had on the Amiga. And then, I, in this case, it's putting the output into the um, copy to Amiga folder. And then it's there's a there's a comment at the end that you can actually look at. Um, um, I think they're mostly generated here also. Yeah, so you can actually go into these log files and um, look at what the result from those verification programs were. I, I won't go into these. If, if you're interested, you can investigate them yourself. But I mean, basically, it's making lists of. Uh, it's it's making uh, check si information you need to check the size uh, to check the check the content um, and stuff like that. So yeah, labels and lists of labels and stuff. So. Anyway, so um, let's go over to the army gun and see what it looks like there. So now we're in the Amiga, and I won't go through how to uh, share the source code. That, that's in my previous video, so as long as you follow that, um, you, I'm assuming you have the setup, so we know. And you've downloaded all the stuff from GitHub and set it up. But now we're in the copy to Amiga, and then um, we basically we say execute. And of course, Amiga is not case sensitive, so you really wouldn't need to actually enter everything case sensitive. Um, test. Oh, let's see how it goes. Uh, what did I write wrong now? Oh. 
Ah. Yes. I spell stuff and everything. <laughs> anyway, I put some echoes, so it's not echoing everything, but um, yeah. it shows you the main se the execution of the main sections at least. So you can see that they're complete. So this is picking up everything we've compiled and it's um, copying the files to the uh, locations in the Amiga system and the Amos installation on the Amiga. So those are replacing everything that we that was installed from the installation disk that is binary. And here it's compiling uh, all the um, tools. So it's, it's doing the same test that the Amiga compiled did when you were compiling on the army. So I thought I'd keep this as a sandy. Now then, the issue is, does this work? Well, the actual compi online compile, uh, online, uh, not online. <laughs> the command line compiler that is related to um, uh, Amos Pro that we have compiled and the related libraries seem to work because this is running the compile. And you can see actually if you look at the garbage that is produced before the date, before the year, that's where you're supposed to have your registration information. So when you install it and then the install asks for your name, a first name and last name, and then it applies, it generates a registration code, then if I understand that's actually written into the binary, as it's written into these um, binary files, the executable files. <laughs> Talk about good old fashioned program. So you actually get the, uh, the executable uh, registration stamped. So, so here we can see that it's not registered. Uh, Let's, um, what did I say? We were going to look at, um, yeah, let's do this. Let's go into, so if you, if you followed my previous videos, then this system already had Amos Pro installed, Amos Pro plus the compiler 2.0 installed. And now what we've done is we basically replaced all the binary files with the ones that we compiled on Windows. Now we need to restart the uh, Amiga instance. Uh, this mistake I always make because now I've actually uh, I, 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 when we copied all those files I still uh, I was in this session and I did start the Amos Pro so that's a bad idea so so now this is a good example so um, you, when you when you've done that copying and the initial test and that seems to work then then uh, if you've been running the old copy of Amos Pro then I suggest that we uh, we kill the emulator and restart it. So now we have a rebooted emulator, so it, it uh, wiped out any memory out of the old um, Amos Pro uh, binary setup. So. I have to remember with Amigas is that they they were atrociously bad. If you close an application, whether it actually closed it or not, is yeah, it's, yeah whatever. So reboot. <laughs> anyway, so this is what I was going to show. So now when we rebooted the uh, had copied the file, rebooted, then uh, then we could start the Amos uh, profession. And here we also we can see this is a hint that this is the new binaries because now the. Uh, 
if you watch my previous video, then you saw that I registered under a certain name, and now it's gone here. It says it is not installed. And um, let's see. Actually, I'd take a. Uh, let me just take a, an example here. Uh, let me take this one. Whatever it's. There's, if you want to test, you can run through them. And, and I mean, have I extensively tested the, the, every, every single sub-functionality of this works? No, I haven't, but um, I, this test I've actually done. Yeah, so, yeah, so a most application seems to run. So, We could um, compile. Ah, we could just compile this one. What the heck? Uh, just to show that the. Or should we use compiler shell to compile a utility? Yeah, let's do that. So, here we have this one. No, this was the illogicality with the compiler shell. That here you say what do you want to compile, like from a disk or an existing or a list of programs, and um, what type of executable you want to have. CLI executable, workbench executable. But you don't get to choose anything. So actually, you have to click now. Now when you've selected this. And then we just have it like that, whatever. Uh, and now when you select compile, then it will start asking what <laughs> what do you want to compile? Uh, let's see. Actually, what I thought I'd demonstrate is... Now, of course, I don't have them here, because this is the Windows data direct. Uh, Let's take this help AMOS then. Because of course on my Windows compile setup I don't actually have those AMOS programs. Uh, present a destination file. No! Oh, so sorry. We're supposed to write it in this field. Oh, my mistake. There we go. I wrote it in the wrong field. Hey, more testing! Yeah, couldn't find an output file to use. Ah! I completed. So, um... Yeah. So now you saw that the, the editor seems to start up and work. Uh, you, we can start the compiler shell and, and use it if I wasn't such an idiot at not knowing how to use it. Um, 
and that's pretty much it. So, yeah, that's it. So, I mean, of course, one can argue how well is it tested, is it really working or not working, but um, at least the basics seem to be there. So, um, yeah, happy hacking. And, and I must say that compiling it on Windows is like. And as I said, the one can strip out those uh, validation programs, the the, Py, the the execution of the Python code, because the, except for the hunks, the logic, it's it's not needed. And, and if you were just going to make some, uh, yeah, code investigation or just small minor changes on one of the files, then you could actually mo also modify the the um, build stream to just do one file, and that would be like practically uh, instantaneous. However, there is the issue, I think, the, just as a warning, that Amiga uh, might be doing some level of, um, and probably is, uh, file or binary um, uh, caching or not freeing up the content of memory and other stuff. So, so as, you, as, as we saw, that on an Amiga, there's no guarantee that things actually do go away. If you close a, if you close a window, it doesn't mean that the, the, the system goes away. <laughs> so basically, I think that the, in many cases, it will still be required to reboot the emulator to be clear, to really be sure that one, um, like if one's going to iterate between instances of the editor, then uh, yeah, still would probably recommend rebooting the emulator. But anyway, it's still the com compiling is a lot faster. Whew. And it's so hot. Anyway, happy hacking, and I'll see you in the next one.